And when the king arrived and the commoners saw him, they all knelt down before him, saying, Welcome, our lord, King Richard. We will have no other king but you. And Wat Tyler, their captain and leader, prayed on behalf of the commoners that the king would permit them to seize and deal with all the wretches who had betrayed both him and the law. The king gave them permission to seize all those who were traitors and could be proved as such by due process of law. And the commoners required that from that moment onwards no man should be a serf, nor give homage nor any type of service to a lord, but should give four pence as rent for every acre of land. They demanded also that no one should be forced to serve a lord, but should only ever work as he wished, and by means of such agreements as were mutually agreed. So that was a chronicler describing one of the most famous moments in all English history. A mile end, outside London, the 14th of June, 1381, on the one hand, the boy king, Richard II, and on the other, the rebels led by Wat Tyler, the great protagonist of the so-called Peasants' Revolt. And Tom, last time you gave us an absolutely masterful dare I say, magisterial. You can, if you like. Account of the origins and character of this peasants' revolt, which wasn't really a peasants' revolt, as, as, as you explained. And we ended, I think you chose a very well-judged metaphor. You said that uh, Richard and his ministers <laughs> were staring down the barrel. <laughs> I did. And there was a cliche fest, wasn't it, the last episode? It was a cliche fest. They were staring <laughs> down the barrel because the rebels are outside London and the king is inside. Do you want to just remind people what their grievances were and their demands? It's an unprecedented situation. I mean, that passage, the reason why it's such an iconic moment, the idea of an anointed king going out and negotiating with someone who stands at the head of commoners, mere commoners, it's astounding. And then agreeing to um, those commoners' terms. Yeah. But how do we get there? How do we get to the situation where Richard is willing to, to put himself absolutely in the line of danger to go out and, and, and do these negotiations? Because you might think, particularly if you are a, a peasant who is perhaps standing on Blackheath next to Wat Tyler, gazing down the Thames towards London, you are staring at, by miles, the largest city in England. Yeah. A very, very formidable and intimidating site. Um, most of the rebels will not have seen London before. So the likelihood is that they will be very overawed by the spectacle. Um, London has about 50,000 people at this time. I mean, so three times as much as the next larger cities, York or, or, or Norwich or Bristol. It's pretty much recovered from the plague. The docks are crowded with ships. There are cranes everywhere. The streets are so crowded that um, people have begun basically building loft conversions. So they're kind of building upwards. So the, the streets have become kind of even more crowded. Um, and I think that if you are a, a, a peasant gazing at this great city, you are noticing some very obvious structures that are going to alarm you. So you are most obviously going to notice the Tower of London, which is by far the most kind of forbidding um, fortress in the city. Um, and this is where the leading officials of the royal government have taken refuge. So the king himself, his mother, the wife of um, the Black Prince, Sudbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Hales, the, um, uh, the treasurer, John Legg, the upskirter, and many other people who... <laughs> That's not an official title, I should, uh, should emphasise. <laughs> the upskirter persuivant. Um, so um, that's where they are, and no one has ever taken, no one has ever captured the Tower of London. So it has a reputation for being impregnable. Beyond that, you have the great spire of St. Paul's and the Bishop of London, which previously had been Sudbury, who's now the Archbishop of Canterbury. You know, he exercises ecclesiastical jurisdiction over Essex. So, you know, that St. Paul's is also an intimidating place. Beyond St. Paul's, you can just about probably make out the Twin Towers of Westminster Abbey, uh, founded by Edward the Confessor, who is Richard II's particular patron. And Westminster, of course, is the great centre of, of royal power. And Westminster Hall, which is, still stands, part of now of um, the Houses of Parliament, 
this is the great depository of records. So, you know, that's also very much on the uh, the target list of the the assembled rebels. And of course, between Westminster and the City of London, on the Strand, this this road which runs next to the Thames, so hence its name, you have Savoy Palace, which is the great headquarters of John of Gaunt, the most powerful man in the kingdom, the uncle of the king, by miles the richest person uh, in England, and an object of great hatred among many different strands of people. So he's very much disliked by uh, by the rebels outside London. But as we will find out, there are also people within London who have reason to dislike him. However, John of Gaunt is not in London at this time. He is away in the north, um, busy negotiating a truce with the Scots. However, his son, his only son, Henry of Derby, as he's called, um, Henry Bolingbroke, um, the 14-year-old cousin of Richard II, he is in London and has taken refuge with his cousin Richard. Oh, the, in the irony, tower. Tom. The yeah. irony. Very yeah. nice. So these are ironies that we will tease out later in this series. So the rebels are gathered um, on Blackheath. They don't immediately advance. It's by now. It's the it's the twelfth of June, and the reason that they don't is that for them there is only one crossing point into London, and that is London Bridge. Um, there are no other bridges across the Thames. Um, and London Bridge is held against them uh, on the orders of the mayor, who is a man called William Woolworth. Um, meanwhile, on the northern bank, the, the rebels from Essex and Suffolk have gathered on Mile End, which is uh, described by a chronicler of the time as a fine open space situated in the middle of a pleasant meadow. Uh, anyone who lives in Mile End now probably won't recognize <laughs> that description. Um, and so there's... There's a kind of standoff, except that in the afternoon of the 12th, various bands of rebels from Blackheath start advancing along the south bank of the Thames because there are settlements that are that are along the bank of the Thames. Um, so there's in uh, the Southwark, which is on the south side of, of London Bridge. And you have very, you have some very famous prisons there. So you have the Marshalsea, which oh, yes. lasts right Little the way Dorrit. up to the 19th century. Yeah. So Dickens's father ends up being in prison there. It's chiefly a place for, for debtors. Um, and you have the Clink, which is such a famous prison that it's kind of, you know, it's become a name that serves for, for, for all prisons. And the, the rebels descend on them, open them up, release the, the prisoners. They also, um, they target local informers, which suggests that by this point, they are being joined by people who are from Southwark or perhaps from further afield. So I, I love in the in the kind of the histories of this period. You you get rebels from notorious trouble spots such as uh, Wandsworth, Tooting, Balham, all, all all these places that are now kind of very um, well. They're not hotbeds of rebellion. I think it would be fair to say. Um, these are all villages at the time, there, right? They're all little villages that are yes, south of London. Um, and there is one place, of course, that 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 is a particular object of um, hatred for the rebels, and that is Lambeth Palace, which stands on the south side of the Thames and is the London home of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Sudbury, who is, of course, you know, the the rebels from Kent particularly hate. And so they descend on it and there's a great orgy of sacking, um, chancery rolls are burned, legal documents are pulled out and trashed. Um, they find the wine cellar, they crack open the uh, the wine. And um, in Westminster Abbey, which sits on the other side of the Thames, they look over and um, there's a, a, a monk report, <laughs> cries of a revel, a revel, as they, um, as they burn all the legal documents and imbibe the wine so that's that thing that's always there in revolutions and rebellions which is which people fun. sometimes it's miss fun. which is that yeah it's a tremendous laugh when you're in the the giddy height of it and seized with the ecstasy of destruction a absolutely and particularly if you've got a you know the archbishop of canterbury's wine cellar <laughs> to hand as well i mean that kind of fuels it absolutely yeah. so um meanwhile the rebels have sent Sir John Newington, who people who heard the previous episode, he it was the constable of Rochester Castle who'd been captured and is now being used as their emissary. And they have Sir John Newington's children as hostages, so he has no choice but to, to do what they say. Um, and so he goes to the tower and he assures the king that he is in no danger. He says that the rebels hold and will hold you for their king. And this is absolutely true. 
I mean, the, the, the rebels are very, very royalist. This is absolutely not the French Revolution. And the reason that they, um, they admire and respect the king so much is that um, they, they see owing your lands to the king directly as being much better than owing it to kind of various feudal intermediaries, so magnates or abbeys or whatever. There's a feeling that if you, if you hold your lands directly from the king, then everything is good. That the king can be trusted and tom there's a couple of things here so one is the the people always sort of have this fantasy of the the king as being good and he's being betrayed by cruel and evil advisors corrupt yeah. advisors that's one thing but is there also an element of them kind of sentimentalizing and romanticizing richard the second precisely because he's a boy king i think so and he's the son of the black prince and he's the grandson of edward the third and there are kind of very popular memories of this yes i i think that's absolutely true and for Richard II, who's a 14-year-old boy who has not had control of the government at all, this is actually quite an intoxicating realisation, I think. Um, the sense that he has an authority and a, 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 a charisma that no one else in his government has. And this, I think, will have quite enduring consequences for the rest of the reign. However, for now, he remains very much under the thumb of his advisors. And they say, OK, this is what we'll do. You get on a royal barge, and tomorrow morning we will go down. You have a royal manor at Rotherhithe, which is between Blackheath and, and London Bridge. Um, and you can sail down there, and you can meet the leaders of the, uh, of, of the rebellion and negotiate with them. So this is what happens. 13th of June, Richard hears mass in, in the, the chapel of the tower, gets onto the barge. They head down towards Rotherhithe, and they're appalled to discover that there aren't just a few rebels waiting for him, but the whole kind of mass, you know, they, they people say 200,000 men. We don't know if those figures are, are accurate, but a large, large quantity of people. Richard is perfectly happy to go and negotiate with them still. He's personally very brave, but his, his advisors say, no, there's no way we're risking that. And so they basically, they steer the barge around and they go back to the tower. And this infuriates the rebels. And so they advance en masse to London Bridge. And despite the orders that the mayor, William Woolworth, has given, no attempt is made to hold it. And this is probably because London Bridge is key to the prosperity of London. So they just don't want to risk it being destroyed, the, 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 you know, the, the, the city fathers. Because as you said, it's the only bridge across the Thames. That, that surprised me. I didn't realise that. So it's the, it's, the, it's the great pivot for the whole kingdom, really. And if that goes, then it, you know, that's a, that's a terribly bad for the financial prospects of all the merchants in the city who are basically running it. Um, but I think also it, it suggests that there, well, we know from what subsequently happens that the rebels have a lot of um, sympathizers in London. And it may be that the gatekeepers themselves are sympathizers. We know that, that, that the keeper of one of the gates, Cripple Gate, is subsequently arraigned for having opened them. Um, and it, it, it just suggests that there was no real prospect of holding London that you know the rebellion the bushfires of rebellion dominic are, are are waiting to flare into life within the city right. as well as without okay so the rebels from kent cross london bridge meanwhile the rebels from mile end have forced their way in through Aldgate, uh which is uh the the city in the, the gate in the east and they very rapidly take control of london and as had been the case in kent and essex so now in london the destruction is very, very targeted. So there are some very predictable objects <laughs> of the looting and vandalism that now ensues. So listeners from the previous episode, we mentioned Sir John Hales, who is um, uh, the, the Lord Treasurer and therefore very hated as the guy who is held responsible for the poll tax. But he's also the prior of the Knights Hospitallers and the Knights Hospitallers have their headquarters in Clerkenwell at the Priory of St. John of Jerusalem. And this is systematically disassembled. All the charters, all the court rolls, all the writings and everything taken out and burnt, as happens again and again throughout this rebellion. And then uh, the whole of the priory is torched, and it is said that the fires burn for seven days. But of course, Dominic, the obvious, the prime target for the rebels is Savoy Palace. John of Gaunt's palace, yeah. John of Gaunt's great headquarters. 
And this is raised so thoroughly to the ground that basically not a brick is left standing and there's no prospect of John of Gaunt putting it back together again. Again, all the records are destroyed, but so too are, are, are Gaunt's possessions. And what's, what's fascinating is that the rebels make a point not of, of taking them away, of stealing these property, but of, of destroying them. So they, you know, uh, um, furs and tapestries and so on are burnt. Um, anything that they can't burn, so gold and silver plate or jewels or whatever, they just go and dump in the Thames. And they make a real point of this to the extent that anyone who is found looting is killed. For instance, someone steals a, a silver plate and is thrown into the flames. And there's a very salutary tale that is much repeated that um, 30 of the rebels had broken into John of Gaunt's wine cellar and had got riotously drunk on it. And the palace then collapsed on top of them. And they were, were trapped underneath and uh, they were stuck there for seven days until they all died of starvation. So all that suggests to me that they have a, that the spirit that is moving them and doing all this is is probably quite religious. Because, of course, at the time, there would be no sense of, or very little sense of political um, commitment that wasn't religious, that wasn't seen in, in in Christian terms. So am I right in thinking they're probably seeing this, you know, that what we talked about last time, the Protestant element, it proto-Protestant, is probably quite strong there when they're sacking John of Gaunt's palace. I think to a degree. I think they... they... They, yeah, so, that, so they cast themselves as lovers of truth and justice, not robbers and thieves. They feel that they are summoning England to a better future. Right. And therefore, they want to present themselves as very much as agents of light. But it is also clear that there are elements within London who, who sees this as an opportunity to get their own back on their enemies. So many of these are highly wealthy in, in fact, some of the wealthiest people in the kingdom. So these are London merchants who like to exercise monopolies over various aspects of trade, but which John of Gaunt in his his role as the kind of the leading figure in the royal government has been selling to foreign merchants. And this has generated enormous resentment among the leading figures in the city. It's it's generated kind of immense hatred for, for for the kind of the foreigners among them, the Italians and the um, the the Fleming merchants. But it also means that John of Gaunt himself is particularly hated. And although lots of the, the places in London that are targeted are, are kind of obvious, you know, they're prisons again, they're kind of record offices. You do also get um, the deliberate targeting of people who wouldn't be known to rebels from Essex or Kent, and the the, the key figure. Uh, is a guy called Sir Richard Lyons, who is the son of a Norfolk landowner and a, a Flemish mother. So he is always referred to as a Fleming, even though he's he's half English. And he is um, a financier, a monopolist. So he had the monopoly on the sale of sweet wine. Um, he is repeatedly accused of fraud against the Exchequer. And he is hated by his fellow monopolists in London as an ally of John of Gaunt. Um, and in fact, he, his effigy in the, the, the church of St. Martin Vintry, which is one of the wards in the city of London, gets destroyed in the, in the Great Fire. But we know from um, uh, an Elizabethan um, account of London that he was portrayed holding an enormous wallet, <laughs> right. which basically sums him up. And he is targeted. He's dragged out from his house and he is beheaded publicly on Cheapside. So you get the sense that leading figures in the city who under normal circumstances would in no way identify with the aims of, of rebels, of peasants, you know, they, they see the chaos as an opportunity to, to kind of get their own back on financial rivals. Right, because the people who are striking at Lyons, let's say, I mean, the people in Essex and Kent couldn't give a damn about it. They don't even know who he is, presumably. Lyons is so notorious that he does have a kind of bad reputation in Essex and Kent because he owns properties out there. But I think that they wouldn't know where his house was in London. Right. The people who are, are staging this kind of um, this, this mur judicial murder are clearly operating with the say-so of his, you know, the rival factions with commercial rivals within the city. So it's all chaos. And meanwhile, Rich, poor old Rich II is on the White Tower, gazing out across London, and he's basically thinking, oh, God. And just, to, just to, for a second, Tom, 
I know we, we've got to go to a break before Theo intervenes. Just Richard II, in a couple of sentences, give us some sense of his personality. I mean, he's only 14 years old, but he's a very bright boy. He has an elevated sense of himself, doesn't he? Very elevated, um, yeah. And he... Do we know much about his character at this point? We, we we know that he is very conscious of his dignity as king. We know that he is very smart and we know that he is uh, very brave. Um, but we also know that he is untested. Right. That, you know, he is only 14. Yeah. And the question of how much agency he has in what follows is contested because we just don't know. However, I I suspect that he probably has more agency than he would have done in a situation where the royal government is still cohering um because it it becomes clear that day that london gets taken by the rebels that actually richard's advisors have no idea really what to do so they try and get the rebels to disperse by offering a general pardon and this doesn't work because the rebels say they won't until serfdom has been abolished until the traitors in the tower have been handed over and since the traitors in the tower are basically the royal government yeah you know they're they're stuck they're not quite sure what to do and so they they stand there and they watch as the fires spread and more and more of their kind of you know their manners and their properties are, are, are destroyed and so as dust starts to fall the mayor uh william woolworth who is very punchy um, he suggests that they should um, get, you know, all the troops they can and sally out from the tower. He says that, you know, these people aren't soldiers. We can we can destroy them. But there are um, very proficient military figures in the tower with Richard, of whom the most experienced soldier is the Earl of Salisbury, a veteran of um, the Hundred Years' War. And he says, no, don't do it. Uh, we haven't got enough. We haven't got enough men. Um, and you know, we, we, we risk two things. We risk an absolute bloodbath and we risk the possibility that, that we won't be able to prevail. Um, and so by the next morning, Richard's councillors have decided that they have no choice but to allow the king to go out and negotiate. The one thing they didn't previously want to do, right? The one thing they didn't previously want to do. And the question is, are, are they sending Richard out to negotiate in good faith or not? I, I think the councillors almost certainly are not. Uh, I mean, of course they're not because they, you know, they face being, probably being lynched if they, uh, you know, if the rebels have their have their way. But I think maybe for Richard, maybe it's different because he is by now very aware that the rebels have a strong personal devotion to him. You know, and if you're a king and you're 14 years old, I mean, this is quite invigorating. So anyway, so he gets on his horse and he rides out. Um, with you know his trusted advisors, people who will not serve as red rags to the bull, Dominic, that is the mass of peasants. God, he's staring down the barrel again, isn't he, Tom? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the key, so Richard rides out to Mile End, and there they he he meets with Wat Tyler and kind of several hundred other uh, of, of the rebels gathered around him, and the rebels complain to the king of their intolerable servitude. The phrases and the heavy oppressions. And Richard hears them and he says he has, you know, he, he understands their unhappiness and he agrees to startling terms, which if they had been upheld would have, you know, radically, radically altered the, the social fabric of, of England. So he agrees that yes, serfdom shall be abolished, which is clearly a very radically egalitarian move. But at the same time, he also agrees to um, a, a kind of bonfire of the regulations, Dominic. Um, you know, uh, supply side reforms. <laughs> the Daily um, Telegraph abolition. would love it. Yeah. So, so, so all the all the kind of the monopolies, the tolls, the trading privileges that uh, you know the various merchants in various towns, including London, the abbeys, the monasteries, have habitually exercised. It's agreed that all these will, will will be destroyed, that from this point on, commoners will have the right to trade as and where they please. You know, it's a very, very radical free market maneuver. So it's simultaneously egalitarian and very free market, these negotiations. What Richard doesn't agree to, as far as we can tell, despite the chronicle that you read saying that he does, is that the traitors, in inverted commas, should be handed over. Um but I, I think it's equally clear that in the eyes of the rebels who've been negotiating with him, 
um, this is uh, essentially what Richard has agreed to. And so after the meeting, Richard doesn't go back to the tower. He, we, we're not quite sure where he goes, but he, he definitely doesn't go back to the tower. But the great mass of, of, of rebels who had been with him, they all head off towards the tower and they, they, they get in. So this is the only time in the entire history of the Tower of London that it gets and they get in because there's no defense. Gets forcibly captured because Richard has withdrawn well, the defenses conceivably. We 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 don't know how they get in. It's it's very strange because the tower, of, you know, I mean, it's impregnable. There's no way that they would have been able to force it. So I think the likelihood is, and it's a reflection of the fact that this isn't really again a peasants' revolt. They have, you know, there are people at the head of the of the rebels, probably in London. I mean, probably very very eminent, distinguished figures, um, who smooth talk their way in you know they're talking to the guards they say we've come from the king he says you've got to let us in and so they go in and um and so they break in and again the violence is very targeted so in fact only five people are executed simon sudbury the archbishop of canterbury yeah. you'd expect him it takes eight blows of the axe to eight blows. to chop off his head robert hales the treasurer yeah uh john leg the upskirt of Persuivant, <laughs> right. he goes. Yeah. A lawyer from Stepney, <laughs> right. who has clearly been targeted by some other, probably lawyer from Stepney, who's you know, clearly been fingered. And you know, so, so that's some kind of local vendetta. And then the son of John of Gaunt, Henry, who we, people remember, we said he was in the tower. He manages to get away. Um, one of the, a rebel from Rochester is supposed to have bundled him out. Um, which is very sensible because in due course, the rebel is able to use this as a, a justification for why he shouldn't be put to death. Um, but instead, the rebels, um, they vent their hatred for John of Gaunt on his physician, whom they find there. That's harsh, isn't it? Just The guy's just doing his job. Hippocratic oath, Tom. Yeah, well, you'd say so. Um, so anyway, so this is the state of play midway through this turbulent day on which the King of England has had negotiations with rebel leaders from 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 Essex and from Kent and the question now is will it work will the rebels disperse what's going to happen probably the single well apart from the fact that this revolution had it happened would have completely reshaped english society i mean that is a, that thing about um henry bolingbroke being bundled out by the bloke from rochester that is a momentous moment in english history isn't it if he had been captured and executed the fate of Richard II, the fate of the Plantagenet dynasty, the whole course of English history might well have been very different. And on that cliffhanger, we'll be back after the break and we will find out. Are the peasant revolutionaries, they're neither peasants nor revolutionaries, but that's neither here nor there, but are they going to succeed or will the wheel of fortune turn <laughs> against them, Tom? <laughs> Come back after the break and find out. Welcome back to The Rest is History. The wheel of fortune is turning. And Tom, we ended last time with the rebels having got the concessions they wanted from Richard II, the most astounding concessions in English yeah, incredible history. Incredible concessions. That would yeah. completely change the shape of England's social and economic order, the abolition of serfdom and so on, the egalitarianism of this new world that they're dreaming of. And they have stormed into the tower. They've executed five people, the Archbishop of Canterbury with eight blows of the axe, John de Gaunt's doctor, very harshly in my view, a man from Stepney, because other people in <laughs> Stepney don't like him. Now, what happens next? Right, well, this is the key question. Um, and all Richard's negotiations have been predicated on the fact that it will lead the rebels to disperse. And lots of them do. Lots of them do start heading back to Kent or to Essex or to Suffolk, but not all of them. Um, and this is a real problem because it, it means that Richard still hasn't got London back under control. And um, emphasizing this is the fact that the severed heads of Sudbury, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury and Hales, the treasurer, are being paraded through the streets on spikes and then they are set up on London Bridge in the place where rebels' heads are always put. And what this suggests is that the, you know, the, the, the rebels themselves are now kind of arrogating the powers of the state. So this is all very, very unsettling. What's even more unsettling, particularly if you're a foreign merchant, is that roaming bands of mobs are hunting you down. So over 150 foreign merchants are killed. As we said in the first half, they are particularly associated with John of Gaunt. But, you know, in this period, an English mob never really needs an excuse to be xenophobic. 
And there are 35 Flemings who have taken sanctuary in a church, most notoriously, and they are dragged out and beheaded. The chroniclers write about how the streets are filled with piles of corpses. Um, and so it, it's pretty obvious by the end of the day that Richard is going to have to go and meet the rebels again. What's well, to call them off, basically? To see what he can do, to see if there's something that can be done to just... Calm them down. Yeah, to calm them down, to, to kind of pacify the whole situation. So the afternoon of the 15th of June, he goes to Westminster Abbey um, and he prays at the shrine of Edward the Confessor, who is his particular patron. And he then rides out to another open space, this time on the west side of the city of London, a place called Smithfield. Smithfield is where um, the, the priory and the hospital of St. Bartholomew's stands and, and this is one of the absolute key moments so richard goes there with sir william Woolworth, who is the mayor of london who's a hard man you said very robust in his uh, right disinclination to uh, listen to rebels right um and also uh, a very very celebrated veteran of the hundred years war uh, a man called sir robert knowles and they go to Smithfield and there is Wat Tyler and all the rebels and Wat Tyler has uh, the hapless Sir John Newington with him, the constable of Rochester Cathedral, who's yeah. been the emissary. And um, Sir John Newington escorts Wat Tyler over to the king. And Richard demands to know from Tyler, you know, why haven't you gone? I've given you these concessions. What's, what's up? And Wat Tyler says, well, we want more. Uh, we want all the poaching laws abolished so that we can go and shoot deer whenever we want. Um, we, we're fed up with the right of um, uh, the manorial courts, the, 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 the kind of the feudal lords having the right to try us in their courts. We want them abolished as well. Um, and most startling of all, uh, and this is where this idea of kind of proto-Protestantism, I think, really seems evident. Tyler demands that the entire hierarchy of the church be swept away and that there be only one person left in charge of the church, um, that the clergy should lose all their property, that it should be divided up among their parishioners, um, and that religious communities should only have enough to live on. They shouldn't own anything more than that. Um, and, you know, I think it's hard not to see the influence of John Ball there right. on, on, on those demands. And uh, So, Tom, just on that, is this what Tyler now sort of rummaging around to try and find excuses for the fact that there's been this violence, this orgy of xenophobic violence. And he's, in other words, he's now falling back on, you know, let's think of something else to say, partly because he thinks, well, we can't really go home because if we go home, they'll probably renege on all their promises and we won't get the order we want. Or do you think... No, but I think I think because Richard has given his word on oath and a, a king's word on oath is something that I think the rebels would all trust. And so I think... But actually, it's probably the opposite. I think the rebels think Richard is their friend, uh, that he can be trusted, and that if he's given them as much as he already has done, well, you know, why not ask for more? I suspect is what is going on there. But this thing about that, the abolition of um, much of the church hierarchy, that would be very shocking to a lot of people, wouldn't it? Perhaps more shocking than the economic reforms, than the abolition of serfdom or something, because... You know, they have been brought up to believe in the church. So would this, how many, how much is this reflective of, let's say, what Tyler's own, I mean, you can't, we can't know, of course, but there must have been a lot of people who had joined this revolt who would not have gone along with that. Well, but equally, I mean, I mean and this is kind of part of the, 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 the swirl of political loyalties in this period, it's so confusing, um, that th there are... There are elements of this program of the, you know, the kind of disestablishment of the church, if you want to put it like that, um, that derive from the teachings of John Wycliffe, who is a very significant um, radical Christian teacher at Oxford, who has been particularly patronized by John of Gaunt. So there's, there's a, weirdly, there's a kind of, there's a, a coincidence of um, aims with John Ball, this kind of vagabond preacher who has been inspiring the rebels out in the out in the counties and John Wycliffe this brilliant academic who is sponsored by John of Gaunt and so we just don't know what the cross currents are there i mean again i suspect so richard agrees to all these terms again but i suspect that by now you know he has no intention of up, up, upholding those right i mean so we don't know 
precisely the terms in which he agrees it, because what happens almost immediately after he agrees to these terms is that there's a fracas, and it, the events are so confused that the, the precise outline of action is, is uncertain. But essentially, what seems to have happened is that um, what Tyler is thirsty, it's hot, he asks for um, a jug of water, and then he downs that, and then he asks for a jug of ale. And then he climbs up onto his horse. And at this point, one of the men in the um, the king's retinue cries out that he is a, he's a, a rebel um, and, and kind of denounces him as a, a thief and a robber. And Tyler is mortally offended at this. He kind of rounds on the guy who's shouted out at him. Warworth, the mayor of London at this point, tries to arrest Tyler. Tyler draws his dagger, lunges at Warworth. Warworth... Um, uh, strikes out in turn, catches uh, what Tyler on the on the shoulder. Tyler um, is bleeding really, really badly. Uh, he tries to kind of he, he's still on his horse, clinging onto his horse, kind of crosses back across Smithfield towards his men, but then he slumps out of his saddle. And as he does so, all the archers that are there among the the uh, in the ranks of the rebels are kind of drawing their arrows and and getting ready to shoot. And this is the moment at which Richard II, you know, this famous, famous moment, he rides forwards and he cries out to the rebels, you shall have no captain but me. Just follow me to the fields without and then you can have what you want. And he starts to ride off and the rebels follow him and they head out to Clerkenwell Fields, which is um, kind of a, north, of the, north of the city. And Richard II, he is, he's, you know, he's not riding with the rebels. He is escorted at this point by Woolworth and Knowles and their soldiers, but he goes to, to, um, to Clerkenwell as well. And Knowles by this stage has managed to raise all the city levies. So clearly this is what's been happening in the background is that Knowles and Woolworth have, have been saying, we've got to muster as much armed force as we right. can. And this is what they've done. And getting to Clerkenwell Fields, there are soldiers now that the king can command and they surround the rebels and the rebels effectively have no choice but to surrender. And Richard allows them to leave. The Kentish men are escorted through the city onto London Bridge so that they can take the road back to Kent. Uh, the, 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 the men from Essex and um, Suffolk head back to uh, East Anglia. And effectively with this, the revolt in London is over and it collapses as quickly as it, it, it had begun. Two questions, Tom. First of all, the numbers involved. We are talking about some thousands of people. We obviously don't yeah, know. Tens of thousands, probably. Tens maybe of 10, thousands. thousands. Right, Greggy. Maybe. And yeah. secondly, so what Tyler has had the fracas with uh, the mayor of London. He's suffered this glancing blow on the shoulder, lots of blood. He falls off his horse and then he is what? He's surrounded by his own men and dragged away or what happens to him? Yeah, and they take him. Um, so they've got, uh, they've got the hospital. They've got the hospital of St. Bartholomew behind them. They take him to hospital. Uh, and while he's in the hospital, he gets arrested by uh, Woolworth's men um, and they drag him out into Smithfield and they chop his head off. Right away. No trial, yeah. no, no show trial no, or anything. No show trial. Just that's the end of him. Right, okay. That's the end of him, yeah. And so the um, the rebellion is... You know, is 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 effectively over, and the question is, is is this all planned? And I think it must have been that the the kind of the idea that that you know you 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 take the rebels up to Clerkenwell, you essentially surround them, you disarm them. I mean, it's done very very effective. It's kind of like kettling. It's what the the police do with rioters now, yeah. isn't it? I mean, that's effectively what they do. And the thing with um, uh, what Tyler was that all planned? Was that orchestrated? We don't know. We don't know. The descriptions are so you know. It seems to be such a chaotic thing. I mean. Yeah, maybe. I mean, we, we we just don't know. But what we also don't know, and I think this is a much more interesting question, is what is the attitude of Richard to all this? Um, so there is there is um, there's a notorious uh, thing that he's meant to have said a couple of weeks after the suppression of the revolt in London, where he has gone out into Essex with as part of the commissions that are kind of you know attempting to to pacify the county, and he is um, addressed by. Uh, by villains, by peasants, by serfs from Essex, who come to him and ask him for the rights that he had promised them um, at Mile End and at Smithfield. And Richard supposedly says to them, Rustiki you were and Rustiki you remain. So Rustiki, you know, country dwellers, peasants, you will continue in bondage, not as previously, but in conditions incomparably harsher. <laughs> right. But this, but this, this, this again is, he, he, he doesn't say this. 
um, you know, this is a bit like uh, Walsingham's invention of the the sermon that John Ball gives. It's articulating, it's kind of monkish wish fulfillment. Um, and I think the evidence is, is that Richard is actually pretty reluctant to go back on certainly the promises that he had given at Mile End, so to abolish serfdom and tolls and so on, and, and to issue a general pardon. Because it's actually not until the 2nd of July, so that's, you know, that's a, a good fortnight and more after the suppression of the revolt in London, that he issued, that, that, that he reverses all those uh, promises. And what this does is t- it, it kind of gives scope for rebels out in East Anglia to feel that, you know, when they, w- as they do, they target the great abbey of Bury St. Edmunds. They, you know, they storm the abbey, they, they behead the prior, that they're kind of doing the king's will. Yeah. Um, at St. Albans, which also has a great abbey that again, all the familiar stuff, you know, they burn all the records. And at Cambridge, I mean, it's, it's amazing. We have no records of the university at Cambridge from before 1381 because they were all destroyed. A uh, great bonfire in the center of Cambridge. And there's a kind of very, very famous account of a woman called Marjorie Starr, who as the, the records of the university were, were going up in smoke, danced around the bonfire, picking up the ashes and hurling them on the breeze and shouting, away with the learning of Clarks, away with it. Crikey. Which Sounds is, like um, uh, Tony Blair's son, Ewan Blair. <laughs> He's a, he's trying to get people not to go to university and do apprenticeships. He would enjoy that moment. Well, he would. The, the, yeah, the Marjorie Star of of our day, and disturbances. You know, it's not just in East Anglia. You get them in uh, in um, Bridgewater in Somerset. You get them in York. You get them in uh, Beverly, north of the Humber. So there are the bushfires are smoking across the country, Dominic. So, Tom, but they are about to be stamped out. So, Tom, there's a lovely comparison here. So the things like the Pilgrimage of Grace in the 16th century. You know, when these, there's a pattern in English history that these sort of revolts happen and the king says, fine, you can have what you want. You're, you're good men. I, I will honor your, you know, your justifiable <laughs> yeah. grievances. And then they all go home and they say, hurrah, hurrah, of the, the king. And then three weeks later, the king's men turn up and kill them all. I mean, this is a sort of, it's even like the, the Prigozhin revolt in Russia, right? The mutiny Ex- there. Except that this is the first. This is the first, nothing like this has happened. But Richard II and his men have stumbled on a formula that always works. Tell them they can have what they want and then kill them later. Richard's advisors definitely have. I mean, as I say, Richard's own attitude is more ambivalent. And I think the memory of how the vast mass of the common people had respected his authority and uh, you know, it, it stays with him and is hugely influential on the estimation that Richard will have of his own charisma and of the degree to which he is loved by the mass of his subjects. And this will have an enduring impact on the future course of the reign. But, you know, he, he uh, you know, he's still just a boy. And so he is not responsible for the, uh, the, the, the repression that now happens. So you have John of Gaunt head south. He, he does his stuff. You've got Thomas of Woodstock. He, he goes around pacifying Essex. And the absolute star of the show is a guy called Henry de Spencer, who is a, a descendant of the dispensers who were favorites of Edward II. And he's the Bishop of Norwich. He's the Bishop of Norwich, uh, and he is um, very much a prince of the church. He, um, he, he suppresses the revolt in Cambridge. He goes around um, suppressing revolts across Norfolk. And basically, he's the hero of the hour. It gives him a tremendous taste for fighting, and he gets so carried away that the following year in 1382, he launches a crusade, not against the Saracens, but against the Count of Flanders. The Belgian crusade, Tom. <laughs> we don't talk about yes. that enough. <laughs> so he launches a crusade against the Belgians, and he kills lots of, of, of Flemings, and then he gets bogged down in an unsuccessful siege of Ypres, comes back in disgrace, um, but within two years, he's off fighting the Scots again. Correct. So he, He's a great man of the cloth. Yeah. He, he, he truly is. And by this point, the, the Great Revolt has been well and truly suppressed. Um, so what Tyler has been beheaded, um, John Ball is taken, you know, he gets captured, um, tried and executed. Uh, almost 300 of the leading rebels in all get executed. But otherwise, um, the, the rebels are confirmed in their pardon 
um, initially a pardon is issued, which you have to apply for. So that's kind of acknowledging that you were a rebel. So people are reluctant to do oh, yeah, that. But then good. Richard does, to his credit, issue another one. He just says, you know, every, that there will be no repression. So I think that does suggest that Richard perhaps has a slight guilty conscience over it. But there's no question that uh, objectively, it seems that the, re the revolt has completely failed. So serfdom is never formally abolished. I mean, there are still traces of it you know, in the late Tudor period, um, all the corrupt officials, apart from the ones who've been executed in the Tower of London, remain in place. Um, the the city corporations, the abbeys and so on, they retain their monopolies and their trading privileges. Um, and John of Gaunt is still, by miles, the most powerful person in the kingdom. So none of the rebels' stated aims are achieved. And so you might be tempted to say the whole thing had been a complete failure. Yeah. Except that... I mean, one obvious legacy of it, that there's no more poll taxes. And in fact, there will be no more poll taxes in English history for 600 years. Well, you're thinking of the, the Margaret Thatcher so-called poll yeah. tax, which actually wasn't a poll tax. It was a okay. tax per household called community the community charge. charge. But, but what's interesting is that people called it the poll tax. And there was a sense, wasn't there, that a poll tax by definition was toxic in british politics yeah. because of the association even if people yeah. didn't consciously make a link with the peasants revolt and they'd forgotten everything they ever learned at school oh but i think i think the fact that community charge was so rapidly called the poll tax yeah, it suggests, suggests that, that it there's did a, yeah there's a residual memory of poll taxes being associated with overbearing iniquitous government and corruption and all those kinds of things a absolutely which is why it it became so explosive when mr Thatcher tried to introduce it yeah but i think also just for uh you know going back to the the 14th and then into the 15th and 16th century there is um a kind of institutional memory that you can't push the commons too far that if you you know too many exactions and things will all you know it's it's dangerous and so that's why i think the memory of it is preserved and and yet the, the the revolt itself is very, very kind of ambiguous, actually, in its character, because absolutely it is, as you said, it's remembered as the kind of the origin point of English radicalism, egalitarian, progressive, left wing, if you like. But at the same time, I mean, you could frame it in very different terms. You could say, well, it's royalist. Um, it's very hostile to tax and spend. It's committed to, you know, cutting away red tape. <laughs> And allowing free enterprise to thrive. <laughs> so you could equally say, well, it's actually a very right-wing movement. Um, and I think that we talked about how the 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 kind of the, the center of the revolt is it's the home counties, it's Kent, it's East Anglia, which is the 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 hotbed of Protestantism in the 16th century. Yeah. But of course, Dominic, it's also these these are the places that people will go to the new world in the 17th century. You know, these are these are where the 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 first Americans will be going, and there's a sense I think in which you can you can see many of the themes of American history being foregrounded. Oh, in that's the nice. Revolt. I like that. I didn't see that think, coming. I think that's a lovely idea. Yeah, the uh, uh, distrust of of the apparatus of government, of regulation. Um, yeah, yeah, the, a desire to let aspiration thrive. All of that kind of stuff. I thought you were going to say that all these areas that you've talked about, kind of, I don't know, Suffolk, Kent, Essex, East Anglia, these are Thatcherite heartlands. And if you look at the map of, yeah. of Britain in 1979, 1983, and 1987, Margaret Thatcher's three election wins, these are great Thatcherite heartlands, particularly Essex, where so much of the Peasants' Revolt action took place. And of course, Essex is the home of Essex Man, which is this sort of social stereotype of an aspirational, perhaps slightly xenophobic, um, sort of ultra patriotic, very sentimental about the monarchy, Thatcherite kind of voter. Right. Well, I thought you'd enjoy this. Yeah. I, I thought this is a very Sandbrook maneuver <laughs> right. to um, to cast. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I don't want to overdo it. The the egalitarianism. That motivates them is incredibly, I mean, extraordinary. 
right um had serfdom been abolished completely i mean you know it would have transformed english society but i think there is definitely a kind of proto-protestant proto-american and if you like a kind of maybe a proto-thatcherite strain Very within nice. that as well nice. i mean i think if you know if ken loach can can open a memorial to the to what tyler on on smithfield perhaps norman tebbit could open one <laughs> right exactly as well uh, <laughs> but tom can we end by talking about one person in particular so you've alluded to this several times this must have been an absolute but simultaneously a traumatic but also a foundational moment for the young Richard II because he's 14 years old. He's at precisely the age at which events loom so large for you and they they shape your character. And the fact that he has come out of this with his sense of his own charisma, his own centrality, you know, which must have already existed, but so enhanced by what's happened, that is going to have enormous consequences for him and for England, isn't it? Yes, and and it will lead to the great drama of his reign when he, you know, he takes control. Um, it's it's the theme of of Shakespeare's great history play on his reign. So it will have enormous consequences, Tom, for him and for England. And we'll be talking about that next week, won't we? We will. The story of what happens when Richard um, ceases to be a child, when he takes control of his own kingdom, is is an incredibly dramatic one. Um, very, very momentous consequences throughout the 15th century. Uh, and it's telling that Richard II is the first in Shakespeare's great series of plays that describes the, the triumphs and the disasters of the 15th century. So we will come to that. But I think also what this, what Richard's experience of the Peasants' Revolt should have suggested to him is how complex a society he rules that the kind of the traditional ways of understanding it, that there, there are those who fight, that there are those who pray, that there, there are those who work, are becoming inadequate to explain just how complex English society is becoming. And I think what's fascinating about this particular period, Dominic, is that it's the first time where it's possible perhaps to examine English society in the way that you do in your great series of books looking at the 60s and the 70s and into the 80s. Because in those books, what you do is, and I don't need to tell you because you've written them yourself, but I'm going to do it for the benefit of the listeners. You describe the elites, you describe the, the people in power, but you also describe the other classes of person. Uh, and you give a kind of totalizing portrait of, of Britain at that time. This, I think, the, 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 the 1380s, the, the, the reign of Richard II, is the first time that you can do that in English history. And so before we come on to the kind of the high political drama of, of Richard's reign and his ultimate downfall, I thought it would be fun to do that, to look at the complexities of, um, of England at this time, the social complexities of it, um, and do it through the prism of the man who is often described as the father of English literature, Geoffrey Chaucer. So... Um, that's what we'll be doing on Monday. We will be going on pilgrimage with an extraordinary assemblage of people. And we'll be looking at the relationship that Chaucer, who we chiefly know as a poet, but who was a diplomat, an administrator, a merchant, a civil service, the relationship that he had with lots of the figures that we've been talking about in our episodes, not just on the Peasants' Revolt, but in the Hundred Years' War as well. Brilliant. So next week, we will be returning with Geoffrey Chaucer, the man who invented Englishness, some would say. Uh, or does he? Well, does so he? So much to discuss. The father of the English language and of English literature, or is he? So we'll be talking about Chaucer. Uh, and the extraordinary range of characters in the Canterbury Tales and the fantastic window that gives us into the into the world of England in this period. And then we will come to the narrative climax of this series, which is the um, ascension to full power of Richard II and what happens to him. And crucially, what happens to that other 14-year-old boy who was smuggled out of the Tower of London, Henry Bolingbroke, and whose survival would play such a dramatic role role in the course of English history. And of course, if you're a member of the Rest is History Club, if you're already with us on our own very personal pilgrimage, Tom, through the pages of English history, then you can listen to those episodes right away. If you're not, 
then obviously shame on you, but you'll have to wait till Monday. Goodbye. Bye-bye. 